Our scripture reading is taken, first of all, from Exodus 19, the verses 5 and 6. And for the children among us, if you want to memorize a few important verses in the Bible, I would say memorize these verses because they remind you of why you're here on this earth. And what's good for the kids, it's good for all of us to know these verses by heart. Now, therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Our second scripture reading is Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. Our next scripture reading is from John 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. The Old Testament background to John 15, you'll find here, for instance, in Isaiah 5. The verses 1 to 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and he hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. It will also, I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Now we go to John 15. John 15, the verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean. Because of the word that I have spoken to you, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The catechism lesson for this afternoon is Lord's Day 24. Lord's Day 24, but why can our good works not be our righteousness before God, or at least part of it? Because the righteousness which can stand before God's judgment must be absolutely perfect and in complete agreement with the law of God, whereas even our best works in this life are all imperfect and defiled with sin. But do our good works earn nothing, even though God promises to reward them in this life and in the next? This reward is not earned, it is a gift of grace. Now in my sermon this afternoon, I'll be focusing especially on the last question, question 64 and answer 64. But does this teaching not make people careless and wicked? No, it is impossible that those who are grafted into Christ, there you have John 15 right there, those who are grafted into Christ by a true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. And the lens through which I'll look at that are the first three verses of John 15. I'll just read them again. And listen to these verses through the theme. If we want to bear much fruit as branches of the vine, we need to be receptive to the gardener or the vine dresser pruning our lives with his word. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser or the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch does, that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. I just got to tell you something about the little word clean here. The Greek word for clean here is pretty well the same as for prune. So actually you can translate clean as prune as well. So you already cleaned or pruned clean, we can say, um, because of the word that I have spoken to you. In response to the proclamation of God's word, let us sing together Psalm 139, stanza 13. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, well, our sermon is going to be about being fruitful. And so it's probably good at the very outset to ask ourselves the question, uh, how fruitful are you? And I ask myself that same question. How fruitful am I? How fruitful are you as a person? A Christian person? And how fruitful are you as a Christian family, as a husband and wife? And how fruitful are you as a Christian congregation? You want to be a missional congregation. Well, if you do, and we all want to do that, then it's imperative 
that we need to be fruitful. Uh, fruitful for God, fruitful for one another, and especially when it concerns the mission of the church, fruitful for the world. You see, God wants us to bear fruit. That's the only reason for our existence as branches of the vine. So children, let that sink in. The only reason God created you was because he wanted you to bear fruit. Fruit for God, fruit for your brothers and sisters, fruit for your brothers and sisters in the church, and fruit for the people of the world. It's the only reason we exist. Lord's Day 24 gets at that with that last question about whether this doctrine of justification makes us careless because our good works don't contribute to our justification. And then 64 says, yeah, but if you're grafted into Christ, it is impossible that you wouldn't bring forth fruits of thankfulness. It's the only reason why we exist. And so where does the gardener, where might the gardener need to prune or cleanse you? Prune or cleanse me so that you and I bear more fruit. What might be hindering you and me from being more productive in bearing fruit for God? And especially, are you receptive to the gardener cutting into your life with his pruning knife. And we know that the pruning knife is the word of God. Are you and I receptive to the gardener cutting into our life with his pruning knife so that the Holy Spirit can take the words, the words that we read and the words that we hear, the Holy Spirit can take these words and open these words so that these words resonate in our hearts with their cleansing and pruning effect so that we bear fruit, the only reason of our existence. Our text of this afternoon compels us to ask these kind of questions. Our text is part of Jesus' farewell words to his disciples. It began in the upper room. Children, remember where Jesus put on the apron, right? And nobody wanted to wash each other's feet, so Jesus did that, right? Put on his apron and he washed his disciples' feet. And then he had given his disciples a new commandment. He says, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. And then he had talked about the possibility of not abiding in the Lord Jesus Christ when he had predicted that before the rooster crows, Peter would have denied him three times, yeah, because he wasn't abiding in Jesus through faith. And he had talked about his relationship to his disciples by saying to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then he had spoken to his disciples about the importance of keeping his commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yeah, a lot of people, they play those two off against each other, right? Yeah. 
It's love, right? It's not the commandment. He links them nicely together. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then at the end of John 14, you get this really abrupt ending where Jesus says, rise, let us go from here. So it looks like he now leaves the upper room and he's walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he's walking there with his disciples, it's very likely that he would have seen some vineyards. And as he looked at the vineyard, I'm just kind of trying to reconstruct this, that could have prompted that in him. He says to his disciples, hey, you know what? I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener, and I'm the true vine. And Jesus' disciples, yeah, they're like the children. They go to Credo, right, and, or Yarrow, right? And they, they kind of know your Bible, hey? The disciples, they knew the Old Testament. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, they, they would have heard echoes of the Old Testament. And they may very well have thought of Isaiah 5, where Israel is called a vineyard. And we can call that a vine or a vineyard. It's really the same thing. And when Jesus says, I am the true vine, it would have reminded the disciples of their calling that Israel was a vine or a vineyard. But when they're thinking about Isaiah 5 and Jesus says, I'm the true vine, that also would have reminded the disciples of their failure to be the vineyard of God that God wanted Israel to be. And it wasn't God's fault because God plowed the ground, metaphorically speaking. He cleared it of stones. He put a tower in its midst. I would think that would mean that he dwelt in the midst of Israel, put a wall around it. He did what he could to make Israel a fruitful vineyard. And they bore wild grapes, stinking grapes. So God's going to come in judgment, which he did, when he sent the Babylonians to trample on his own vineyard. And Jesus says, I am the true vine. Jesus is saying, look, I'm the true Israel. You may be familiar with the fact that Jesus is the second Adam. You all know that. I'm not sure whether you all think along the lines that Jesus is, let's say, the second Israel, the true Israel, but he is. It's very important for your understanding of the narrative of Scripture that Jesus is the true Israel. He is now going to bear fruits of thankfulness in Israel's place as Israel's substitute. And he is going to bring forth fruits of thankfulness for Israel as Israel's representative. And in doing so, Jesus is now going to do what Israel failed to do. And what's that going to look like? Well, here's where we get to Exodus 19. But before I get to Exodus 19, I just want to take you into Genesis 12, verse 3, with the calling of Abraham. And why does God call Abraham out of Ur? Verse 3. And God says to Abraham, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's very missional. In you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. You see, God is on a mission for his glory. This is how we grew up, right? If you ask the question, why did God create the world? Well, I already said he wanted you to be fruitful. 
but we can also add to that, he did it for his glory. It's a very Calvinistic thing to say. God created everything for his glory. Well, God's on a mission. He's on a mission for his glory. And the end of his mission for his glory is that the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God like the waters cover the sea. And God wants to be all in all. He wants to be all in creation. As we say, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? He wants to be all in creation, even more so than now. And He wants to be all in you and me, even more so than He is now. So that creation and a new humanity embodies, embodies the presence of God. On earth as in heaven. That's God's mission. He wants the life of heaven, the life of the Trinity, He wants that life reflected on earth. And as an aside, that's why Jesus taught his disciples in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you can add that to those first two petitions as well. Hallowed be your name on earth as in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. God's on a mission for His glory. But the whole world lies in the power of the evil one because of Adam and Eve's sin. The whole world lies in the power of sin. It lies in the power of death. Just look at the cemeteries. All the people dying, one after the other. You and I will die too, unless Jesus returns before that time. The world lies in the power of sin, death, and the evil one. And God calls Abraham out of Ur because he wants to rescue. He wants to rescue the world out of the power of the evil one by having Abraham and his descendants embody his presence by being people in places where heaven and earth, and by being people in places where heaven and earth meet, they can draw people out of the world into the presence of God. And in Exodus 19, those verses you're going to memorize, right? Exodus 19 picks up on Genesis 12, verse 3. And what God basically said to Abraham, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, God is saying to Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai, even though the whole earth is mine, I have made you my treasured possession. But you can only function as my treasured possession if you keep my commandments. And when you keep my commandments, you will be to me a kingdom of priests. What does a priest do? What do I do at the close of the service? I bless you on behalf of God. That's what a priest does. He blesses people. So you need to hear in that when the whole nation is a kingdom of priests, God wants to use the nation of Israel to bless the world, bless the nations. What else do priests do? Well, they teach people the knowledge of God. Well, Israel is supposed to Bring the knowledge of God to the nations. 
I know the movement in the Old Testament is different. In the New Testament, we go out, and the movement in the Old Testament is the nations come to Israel, but in coming to Israel, they give knowledge of God to the nations, like the Queen of Sheba during the time of Solomon. God wants to be known as God. They shall know that I am God. He wants to be known as the only God there is over against all these pathetic idols of the nations. And God wants to use Israel to bring His knowledge, the knowledge of Him to the nations. And He wants to use Israel as a holy nation that is completely consecrated to God. It's like a new garden of Eden. Not quite the same, because there was no sin in the garden at first. And there is sin in Israel. But in essence, he wants Israel there, that little strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea, surrounded by all those nations, he actually wants Israel there to function as a new garden of Eden, embodying the presence of God, showing the nations just how good life is when it is submitted to the laws of God and when they live in communion with God, how the life of heaven begins to manifest itself there in that little strip of land, that narrow strip of land on the Mediterranean Sea. And that's why God dwelt among Israel with His tabernacle and His temple. He dwelt among them because He wanted to consecrate Israel for fruitful service. Be holy because I am holy. That's why God time and again made covenants with the people of Israel. To encourage Israel to be His people. I will be your God. And you have to hear in that, I will be your missional God. And you will be my people. You will be my missional people. And that's why God spoke His word to them over and over again, equipping them for fruitful participation in His mission for His glory so that Israel could bring forth fruits of thankfulness. But Israel failed, failed miserably. And so Jesus, Jesus as the true Israel, is going to do for Israel what Israel failed to do. And what does that mean for the Israel that was living during Jesus' time when he ministered among Israel? What does that mean for them? It means this for them. If you still want to bear fruit, if you still want to be my Father's missional people by bringing the blessing of Abraham to the nations, you are going to have to believe in me. Because the source of your fruitfulness is now going to be located in me because of what I am doing for you and in your place. Even the children can understand this. Imagine if this is the vine and then this is the branch, right? What is the source of the fruitfulness of the branch? It is the vine. The life-giving saps of the vine are generated, reproduced in the branch so that the branch bears much fruit. 
And so when Israel believes into Jesus, is grafted into Jesus through faith, then Israel will bring forth fruits of thankfulness because the source of their fruitfulness is located in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord's Day 24. Question and answer 64. So Jesus is saying to his disciples and he's saying to us today, live in communion with me. I am the true vine and you are the branches. You can only bring forth fruit if you live in communion with me. And then you, you look at the scriptures. It's already, it's already very sad in the Old Testament. Like the Bible talks about a remnant, just a, a small remnant. Like in the birth narratives of Jesus, you read about Simeon and Anna. These are a few of the remnants. And then when Jesus ascended into heaven, and during those 10 days, when the disciples were praying in a house, about how many people were there? A group of about 120 people. Can you imagine that? Jesus was a, a good preacher. He was the true shepherd. And at the end of his ministry, all he had to show for was about 120 people. That's all. Many, 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 many people did not want to believe in Jesus. Didn't want to be grafted into Jesus through true faith. Didn't want to be receptive to his words so that the Holy Spirit could open up these words and let these words resound in their hearts with their cleansing and pruning effect. Also Judas... Judas also wasn't receptive to Jesus' words. He too wasn't open to the cleansing and pruning effect of those words. Also, Judas wasn't available to the leading of these words. He wanted to go his own way, wanted to have his own Messiah. So he ended up betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, just like many of the people of his day, was not a fruitful participant in the drama of Jesus' mission for his glory on earth as in heaven. And what happened to Judas? He was cut off the vine because he was an unfruitful branch of the vine. And what happened to Judas? Sad to say would happen to a lot of Israelites. Paul talks about that in Romans 11, about branches being broken off of the olive tree and wild olive sheets, the Gentiles, contrary to nature, being grafted into Israel. And unless Israel would repent, because the beautiful thing is, you can be grafted back in again. That's what Paul says there. But unless they would repent, the branches would be gathered, gathered together and thrown into the fire. Not so the rest of Jesus' disciples. And as a result, they were cleansed. They were pruned by the words of Jesus so that they could become fruitful participants 
in the drama of God's mission for His glory. And this pruning would continue in the life of Jesus' disciples. For the only reason they exist as Jesus' disciples was, was again what? What's the only reason we exist? Is to bear fruit. So the pruning tends to continue in our lives so that we can bear more fruit. Just listen to the gardener using Jesus, cutting into Peter's life with the pruning knife of the Word of God. Jesus says to Peter, yeah, he's going to rehabilitate Peter. He says to him, do you love me, Peter? And Peter says, you know that I love you. You think that hurt? I think it hurt. I think Peter picked up on that the second time already. Because the second time came. Yeah, but uh, Simon, son of... Do you love me? Oh, Jesus, you know that I love you. See, and the, the pruning knife is going in deeper all the time. And then comes the third time. Simon, Peter... Do you love it? Peter's at his wit's end. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Painful pruning so that Peter can bear much fruit for God and for the church and for the world. Feed my sheep, says Jesus to Peter. And what Jesus did with Peter, God does with us as well. Time and again, God uses the pruning knife of his word to cut deeply into our lives so that we will bear more fruit, be more productive in bearing fruit. And the pruning knife is able to do that because the Word of God, I don't want to give you too much memory work, children, but here's another text. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, bone and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. But the Word of God is only able to do that if you and I are receptive. And I realize the Spirit will give you that receptivity. But He's only able to, if we are receptive to the Holy Spirit, this is really neat, the Holy Spirit takes these words, they're like little jewels, and He opens up these words so that you actually hear you actually hear God or hear Jesus speaking to you through these words. And these words resonate in your heart with their pruning and cleansing effect. And as that was painful for Peter, that's going to be painful for us as well. But the gardener who prunes us, this is a really neat thing. The gardener who prunes us is the father of Jesus. Think that through. The gardener who prunes us is the father of Jesus. That means that the gardener who prunes us loves us just as much as he loves his one and only son, the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. And that means that you and I can always trust that when God cuts into our hearts, into our lives, with the pruning knife of His Word, He does that because He loves us. I come back to the beginning. 
Does the gardener have that kind of effect with his word in your life as a Christian? Does the gardener have that kind of effect with his word in you as a Christian family? In your marriage as husband and wife? Does the gardener have that kind of effect with his word in this congregation when your guest ministers, when your new pastor is going to preach the word of God to you? Does he or will he, whatever the verb you pick, you know, is he going to have that kind of effect in your life? Because the Holy Spirit has made you receptive to the Word of God so that this same Spirit can open these words and have them resonate in your life. Ask yourself this question. Where? Where might the gardener, and I asked it at the beginning as well, where might the gardener need to prune you? Where might he need to prune me to make me more fruitful? What, what actually might be hindering the gardener in having the Holy Spirit be effective in my life and he the same in your life? Do you see how much you need Jesus? Do you see how much you need the forgiving grace of Jesus? All the time that God wanted you to be more fruitful and it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. And you know yourself better than I do why that was the case. Just like I know why it's the case in my life. Do you see how much you need the forgiving grace? of Jesus? Do you see how much you need the liberating grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? That he needs to free you. He needs to free you from things that are stumbling blocks in your life from bearing more fruit for God. Do you see how much you need the healing grace of Jesus? so that you can say with Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. So the nice thing is, Jesus says to you and me this afternoon, he says, come. He says, come to me. Abide in me. Then I will abide in you. I am the true vine, and you are the branches. What I have done for you, remember that? What I have done for you, I want to do in you with my Holy Spirit. So come, abide in me, and let my words abide in you, so that the Holy Spirit opens these words and enables you to bear much fruit as a congregation, as a family, as a Christian. Amen.